Today we're going to leave the 10th century. I know it's hard to believe. <laughs> but it is going to happen. Between the late 11th and the 10th century, what happened? Right, okay, so this is the situation in the 11th century. By the latter part of the 10th, we know this is the situation because this is the map. Um, maybe all of the routes are not correct, but anyway, all of the sites with little arrows pointing at them on this map here are cited in the 156 named cartouches of the pharaoh Shishak, or as he's called in Egyptian, Shoshank, on the Bubastite portal at Karnak. Among the peoples that we haven't, we've sort of lost track of, are the folks that were living up here. So we've been very obsessed with the Israelites and the Philistines, and we've forgotten about the poor Canaanites. What has happened to the Canaanites? The Canaanites uh, move out of the interior of this land. And they seem to be, in fact, a little bit pushed out. Down here in the Shvela, so here's Lachish, the Canaanite sites are destroyed. And in the 11th century, the occupation that occurs on the mounds above the destroyed late Bronze Age and early Iron One levels is Philistine. So the Philistines expand out dramatically, aggressively, into the Shvela, up into the central coastal plain, as far north as the, as the Yarkon River. And in the Jezreel, the Canaanite sites, such as Megiddo, also suffer damage, and the reoccupation is not Canaanite, but the Canaanites don't disappear. There had been, throughout the Middle and the Late Bronze Age, in addition to Canaanite occupation, in the, throughout the interior of what we therefore called Canaan, including the area of the Jezreel Valley, all of the cities of the coast, the great cities of the coast, from Ugarit here in, uh, in the, on the northern Levantine coast, almost opposite of northern Cyprus, down through Byblos, Beirut, modern Beirut, ancient Beritus, Sidon, Sarepta, Tyre. All of these were Canaanite cities. They, too, wrote agitated letters to the pharaoh in Egypt during the Amarna period saying, the sea peoples are coming, the sea peoples are coming, send help, and things like that. So we have documentation from them. You're looking at a pretty aerial view here, a uh, view of Byblos and a Google map view of Tyre. How do we know in addition to the text? Well, we have lots of material finds from these places in the Late Bronze Age and the Iron One. Unlike the Canaanite cities in the interior, these cities, some of them suffer some modicum of destruction at the hands of the Sea Peoples in the early part of the 12th century, but then the Sea Peoples move on. They don't inhabit these sites. They keep on going, and the, and the occupation in at these coastal places continues to be Canaanite. So here, for example, at the city of Byblos, from the middle of the 13th century, is a, was found a royal cemetery because there were a series of kings. Well, we knew there were kings, Canaanite kings. We had evidence of that from uh, pictorial representations at uh, Megiddo and the throne at Hatzor, and of course it was these kings who wrote these agitated letters to the pharaoh in the late Bronze Age, the Amarna letters. So anyway, there was this king, Ahiram, and his sarcophagus was found in the royal cemetery at Byblos, and it has an inscription that says, the coffin was made by Ethobal. Ethobal uh, was the son of Ahiram, king of Byblos, as the eternal resting place for his father. If any ruler or governor or general attacks Byblos and touches this coffin, his scepter will be broken. Uh, so here's the inscription. Here's the scene. Both the language, the letters of the inscription, and this scene should quickly remind you of, and convince you in case you needed convincing, the similarity between the visual and literary culture of the cities of the coast 
and the cities of the interior. So here, for example, is uh, we have to assume Ahiram, the king of Biblos, seated on his sphinx throne, just like on the ivory knife handle from Megiddo. Here is the king of Megiddo, we suppose, seated on his sphinx throne. Uh, various courtiers, musicians are approaching him, just as here on the sarcophagus of Ahiram from Biblos, same thing. And the letters, the Canaanite alphabetic script incised on the sarcophagus of Ahiram are the same as Canaanite letters that we have, for example, here on the Lachish Ewer. In the 12th, in the 11th, in the 10th centuries, as Canaanite cities in Canaan are attacked and abandoned, the peoples who had lived there settle more firmly along the coast, along the central and northern coast. And this region, then these folks who are very not aggressive. They, don't, they didn't make too much warfare in the Bronze Age in Canaan. They don't seem to fight back too much. You know, those cities get attacked. There's not evidence of um, counterattacks. They, they, just, they just leave. They leave, and, and what they do is they reorient their society and economy to the reality of their new homeland, well, but their old homeland, but now their, their sole homeland, of these coastal cities. And because they are so firmly embedded on, on the coast, they turn to another form of support for their economy, and that's largely trade. Because the mountains of um, this is mostly modern-day Lebanon and in part southern Syria. The mountains, or the mountain ranges here, uh, go right practically up to the coast, and there's very little agricultural hinterland for these folks. So they move out into the Mediterranean. And we know they move out into the Mediterranean most confidently because we find evidence of their writing all through the eastern Mediterranean, along the North African coast, in uh, Sicily, Sardinia, and even as far west as southern Spain. And these are the letters of various inscriptions now taken out of their inscription format and put in alphabetic order. So Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalid, for example, an ABC degree, put in uh, alphabetic order so that you can compare the letters of these various inscriptions that were found on objects and artifacts and stones throughout these various far-flung territories. In their perambulations, these Iron Age Canaanites come into contact with the folks that were living here in Greece. The Greeks borrow this handy technology of the alphabet, which they did not have. They did not have an alphabet prior. They had written language. They spoke Greek, but they didn't write in alphabetic form. They wrote in a weird, complicated set of signs that we call linear B. And uh, in the havoc that came with the end of the Late Bronze Age, the technology for writing Linear B fell by the wayside. So the people who lived here were illiterate in the sense that they did not have a written language for a couple of hundred years. But when these folks come into contact with these folks, they learn how to write. And by the 8th century, the Greeks have picked this up. And here, for example, is a Greek jug from Athens with an inscription. And here you see a detail of that inscription. And you can readily see the uh, debt that the Greeks owe to these folks who invented and, and refined the alphabet. So here, for example, is a Greek alpha. There's an aleph and um, tet and tau and, and so on and, and so on. 
so the Greeks borrowed the alphabet, and in addition, they named these seafaring folks in a collective way. The people who lived in these cities, Biblos, Sidon, Tyre, etc., called themselves Biblians, Sidonians, Tyrians. They didn't, they didn't call themselves Canaanites, and they didn't group themselves together, even though they worshipped the same deity, they spoke the same language, they used the same alphabet, they shared the same socioeconomic system, they both engaged in trade, and so on and so on. But each city conceived of itself as an independent city entity. But the Greeks named them, and they named these folks, who are the Biblical and Bronze Age Canaanites, after one of their most famous products. And one of their most famous products was a kind of purple dye. And so they named them after the Greek word for purple, which is, um, come, comes from the, the root phoenix. And they called them Phoenicians. And we know that from the earliest written Greek texts that we have, which are the Iliad and the Odyssey. There are one, two, three, four, five, six places in the Iliad and the Odyssey. Anybody who cares, I've got all of the citations here. Um, where the Phoenicians are mentioned in the tales of the Trojan War and the return of the heroes from Troy. And the Phoenicians in the Homeric epics in the Iliad and the Odyssey have two outstanding characteristics. One is that they're excellent craftspeople. They make the finest textiles, bronze vessels, silver items, jewelry, wine bowls, etc. And they are par excellence seafarers. They are sailors. So, for example, in Odyssey 15, when Eumaeus is telling his master Odysseus, finally returned from Troy, of his early life uh, um, among his adventures, Eumaeus says, Then came Phoenicians, men famed for their ships, bringing countless trinkets in their large black ship. So that's how the Canaanites come to be regarded in Greek lore. And therefore, in the Iron Age, we call these folks who had been Canaanites, who now just move into this zone, uh, Phoenicians. Even though they themselves would have never called themselves that. Sir? Yes, their culture is the same. So they continue to worship Baal and Ale. They have a pantheon. They worship, just like the early Israelites did, the sun, the moon, and the stars. They have nature deities. But their main, their, their main deity is Baal. You, you saw the name of the son of Ahiram, Ethobal, so a name that includes the Theophoric, that is the god's name, Baal. Um, and uh, they... So they have kings, and uh, they have international connections, and they live in big cities, no, no longer fortified cities. Um, what does Phoenician, now I'll stop talking about Canaanites and start talking about Phoenicians, even though they're the same people. What does Phoenician material culture look like in this period? We have a nice... Um, example from this little town, Achziv, which is about 25 kilometers south of Tyre and about 15 kilometers north of Akko and is very close to the northern border of Israel with Lebanon. And here at Achziv, a series of cemeteries have been excavated that range in date from the 11th century BCE through the 4th century BCE. So there's a settlement here for a long time. And in the 10th century BCE, here is a collection of items from one tomb. There are a whole bunch of tombs of all different sorts. Some are rock cut shafts, some are burials inside ceramics, some are pit graves, um, some are actually built structures in, in, into which a body was placed. So the form of the tomb is not representative of a single belief system because there were all sorts of tomb types. 
kind of similar to today. Some people are cremated, some people are buried in above ground chambers, some people are buried in shafts in the ground. Doesn't mean that we all believe something different. Yeah? Spell Achziv? A K H Z I V. So in one of these tombs, for example, are um, a series of red slipped polished juglets and dishes. Polished, shiny red slip is a characteristic of the ceramics of the Phoenicians that, as you will learn, is a very long-lived predilection. Um, figurines. This is a little terracotta donkey. He's very cute. He has his load on his back, and he looks bright-eyed and eager to trot away, helping you out. Um, a, a fish amulet uh, uh, that is made out of glass. The Egyptians knew how to make glass. And uh, it's, it's, uh, and it's small. And so this is a, a trinket or a goodie of the sort that in the Odyssey, um, Eumaeus says the Phoenicians are used to having on their ships these little trinkets filled with countless trinkets, um, goods that reveal their interactions with people throughout the Mediterranean. So here this little Egyptian glass amulet and this terracotta figurine of a woman who is pregnant, perhaps a deity, perhaps a wish for fertility, perhaps a votary, that is uh, an acolyte of a fertility deity, giving thanks for the gift of life that the deity has brought her. Um, but indicative of a belief in a strong female supernatural force, in addition to uh, the um, um, male deity. So these are just various items, and similar sorts of goods are found in many of the other tombs in the cemetery at Arsif. So by the latter part of the 10th century, when Shishak slash Shoshank marauds through this area, the Canaanites have moved out of all of this area and are now living only along the coast and all the way up, you know, all the way up to about here. <laughs> this is where Ugarit is. And as you see, Shishak doesn't care about them, doesn't engage with them, they don't give him any trouble, and he doesn't give them any trouble. All of the fighting is against the various folks that are within the old land of Canaan. And we know by the time that he comes through, among many other things that you know from doing your reading, we know from this class so far that three major old Canaanite cities have received substantial rebuilding. And they are Chatzor, uh, up here in the north, Megiddo in the um, Jezreel Valley, and Gezer down here in the, down here someplace, there it is, um, in the Shvela. The rebuilding at Chatzor and Gezer is very similar. At both sites, in the first half or three quarters of the 10th century, a fortified citadel is constructed in the area where there had been a very large city. And that citadel has a couple of characteristics shared both by, by both places. And now you get to spend a minute chatting with the person next to you. What do these places have in common? Chatzor and, and Gezers. We talked about these last time, so you already have some information about this. You might want to look at your notes. Talk with Tom, you guys. 
It's it. Yeah, blown glasses. Oh yeah. We're, we're, oh, because I was reading all the glass stuff and I was blown. Like, Wait a minute. Yeah, no, 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 no. But um, <laughs> it's it's uh, it's it's formed in a it, it, it it's um, the the raw materials and they're put in a little mold. Yeah, like Tim just said, and they're melted. Okay. And that's why it's all rough on the outside. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. We're gonna go see a glass blower next week. I just did that to you. I hope I didn't. It's okay. It's okay. Oh, sorry about that. Just wandering, making sure people are. Oh, I forgot I was supposed to hit pause. All right, where were we? Okay. All right. Things that uh, the. Iron 2A, the first half of the 10th century, first three quarters of the 10th century. BCE, occupations at Hatsor and Gezer have in common. Tell me something. Um, they both have a similar gate. They have a very similar gate. Indeed, they do. A six-chambered gate, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, um, chambers. The gates have towers in front. Here are the towers of the Chatzor Gate. The towers of the Gezer Gate are a little different. They're actually the inside um, walls of the casemate, so they aren't freestanding towers. And while the plan looks very, very similar, not all the details are the same, including their size. So uh, the Gezer Gate is 18 meters to a side, evenly. Um, and uh, in fact, I think it's 18 meters square. 17, sorry. And the case and the wall of the gate at Chatzor is 20 and a half by 18.2. So it's a little bit bigger. But other than that, very, I mean, you know, pick, 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 right? That's kind of insy. Uh, so, yes, very similar gates. Something else? Mm -hmm. They both have a casemate wall. Yes, they do. They both have a casemate wall. A casemate wall is a double wall, an inner and an outer, with rooms separating the... Um, the in, in sep, making a separation on the inside. The rooms are sizable. So, for example, at Hatsor, here the rooms of the casemate wall are between eight and ten meters long. So they're so they're pretty long. They could have been used for storage. They could have been filled up quickly to especially fortify the wall in times of danger. That way, you don't have to go to the trouble of building a super thick wall to begin with, but you can turn it into a super thick wall as necessary and in, and in parts. So that's a casemate wall, and both of them have it. No, we, we don't have any evidence that people use the rooms. Um, in these cases, we don't have any evidence that uh, they were cellar rooms. There certainly aren't any doors going in and out. Um, so the only way you could have been able to get in and out would have been with a ladder. Mm -hmm. And, well, obviously we don't have any ladders. But we, but we don't have any evidence that people were inside those rooms using them. You know, you don't find pottery vessels. It's not like it's a little camp out spot. Stuffed with dirt purposely? Well, sometimes they are. In these cases, they weren't found that way. Uh, well, I mean, they were found filled because they were underneath many other higher layers of stuff. So, but it doesn't look like they were purposely stuffed up. It just looks like the regular fill residue of an archaeological site. What else? Same gate, pretty much. Same wall, pretty much. Yes, 
There's only a small portion of the upper city that's fortified, and it's a remarkably small portion, two and a half hectares of the 6.5 hectare surface of the citadel of Hatsor. That is, I just primed this. I know you guys are going to be dazzled that I remember all these numbers. 38%. 38% of the citadel at Hatsor. At Gezer, even smaller, this is 0.5 hectares. This is a tiny little fortified enclave on a much larger possible spot. So these are quite small. What else? Well, I just have a question. What, what would be the point of that? What would be the point of that? We're about to get to that. That's an excellent question. Tell me one more similarity. Yes, yeah, similar pottery was found on both sites. Um, nothing too fancy. Jars, uh, bowls, cooking pots. Exactly the same sorts. That's pretty interesting that they're exactly the same sorts. Not only because of the chronological link, that's obvious, but because Chatzor and Gezer are kind of far apart. And to have the exact same type of pottery suggests some larger social connection. You can make of that what you want to, but, but it's certainly suggested by the ceramics. What about this building here at Gezer? And there had been... Uh, Those large buildings, they are not, they both, so they aren't built into the wall, but they are, you're probably thinking of the stratigraphic link at Hatsor with the pebble pavement. They're built in conjunction with it. So they aren't architecturally hooked up, but they're stratigraphically hooked up. They're the same level. In other words, it's not just one poor circumscribed barracks. There are large structures inside these protected zones. Um, that big building uh, at Chatzor, and there's another large building right here uh, inside the gate at Gezer. A sizable, a sizable structure looks domestic. That is to say, the finds inside are domestic. Maybe it's some kind of commander or governor or anyway, official. But it's, it's too big to be a private domicile even though the pottery in it is all domestic. So it looks like somebody in charge. There's some accommodation right inside the gate area for some official at both sites. Meanwhile, there's Megiddo. And at Megiddo, things look quite different in the 10th century. There is no casemate wall. There is no six-chambered gate. There is a gate. I mean, there's an entrance to the city. It's very simple. There's a big sloping ramp. It's paved with white plaster. There's a kind of, there's a broad room with a single entrance right in, with a courtyard right in front of it that uh, may well have been uh, a, a spot for ceremonies, some kind of a gate, shrine. I don't know. A lot of houses, a great many houses. Some of them are very large and nice. Some of them are smaller. There are houses all over the place without any discernible plan. No street plan, no organization. The large houses and the small houses are all mixed up in the same parts of the city. There's not an up, better part of town and a worse part of town, an upper class zone and a lower class zone. There seems to be some class differentiation because some of the houses are bigger than others, but the bigger houses are mixed in with in the same parts of the town as the smaller ones. And then there are a few um, palatial or administrative structures, two actually. Pal 1723 over here, which is fortified and has its own projecting four-chambered gate, and Pal 6000 down here.
Who are the fortified citadels at Hatzor and Gezer fortified against? You don't go to the trouble of building something like that unless you have a reason. Look at the map. Who is the citadel at Gezer protecting against? It certainly does look like the Philistines. That's exactly who it looks like. The Philistines, who in the 11th century had expanded with ease throughout the Shvela, right up to the edge of the hinterland of the hills of Judah. And Gezer is a linchpin site right on the edge between the Shvela and the southern Judean hills. And that would suggest that whoever is living on this side of Gezer is organized enough, strong enough, and worried enough to fortify against the people who are living on this side of Gezer. What about Chatzor? Is it the Phoenicians? Is Chatzor being fortified against the Phoenicians? Why not? Why, what is the argument against Chatzor being a fortification to protect whoever is here against whoever is here? Well, how do we know that whoever is fortifying this isn't worried about them coming back? You know, maybe the reason that these folks move out there is because there are fortifications not allowing them. Well, we, 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 know they, we know they do eventually. There are mountains there, yeah. There are mountains here. There's actually, this is not so simple to get across here topographically. Yeah, if, if the Phoenicians are a worry, why does Megiddo look like it does? Megiddo is in a much more tenuous position vis-a-vis -vis anybody living on the coast than Chatzor. It's a straight shot down the Jezreel. It's flat. It's a highway. It's an express route from the coast into the interior. But Megiddo is not fortified. So there must be somebody over here. There must be, so, just like there's somebody over here against whom the Gezer fortifications are constructed, there must be somebody over here against whom the Chatzor fortifications are constructed. And indeed, there is. These folks that we've been talking about are not the only people living here. There are a lot of people living around in this region in this time, been a lot of people. So there is a huge kingdom of folks that we know from Assyrian texts and other texts are called Arameans. Their kingdom is Aram. Their capital is Damascus. And they're around in the 11th, the 12th and the 11th centuries. In fact, they have a language, Aramaic. And the situation of this small but very well fortified spot right here on the high point overlooking the Jordan River Valley and then this, this whole region of what is today the southern Golan looks to be a fortification against here just as Gezer looks to be a fortification against Philistia. 
Now, according to the text of 1 Kings, Solomon had a kingdom that stretched from Tifsa on the Euphrates to Gaza. And then, in a slightly less grandiose formulation, from Dan to Beersheba. But the archaeological evidence does not really look like a good fit for this explanation because this is the northernmost fortification that can be confidently associated with the peoples who had been living here. And this is the southernmost, the fortification at Gezer. And these fortifications look to be against specific enemies. In one case, the expansion of Philistia, and in the other case, the um, threat of expansion from Aram, Damascus. And why then does Megiddo look like this? What is the function of Megiddo in this troika? It, it's in between them geographically. It's very, very different in terms of its plan, its layout, its architecture, the kinds of finds. What's the point of Megiddo? What's the point of Megiddo and why isn't it fortified? So it's on a trade route. It could function as a stopping post for caravans. And so what, what happens between 1025 and 925? The evidence that you have to hand, a fortified, a small heavily fortified citadel here, oops, here at Chatzor, a small heavily fortified citadel here at Gezer, a large unfortified town with houses, palaces, perhaps administrative buildings, uh, an easily accessible gate area. Well, I mean, the whole site's easily accessible since there's no wall. You have an administra a big administrative center here in the middle. You have two fortified citadels with very, very specific similarities. Same kind of wall, same kind of gate, same kind of pottery. This looks to be a politically united territory that has two security worries, one at the north, one at the south but no security worries in the interior and a willingness to be an open and, in fact, a clear demonstration of open and easy contact with the folks whose sites you could get to easily from this site, Megiddo, which would be the Phoenicians. Does Megiddo have the same pottery as... Um, yes, Megiddo has the same pottery as Chatzor and Gezer. Did they have something they felt they needed to protect? The sites are not protecting anything except themselves. So no, like temples or shrines? Nope. Nope. I'm just curious, is that how you date Megiddo to the same time as Gezer and Hazor is by the pottery? Yes. Yes, it is. And because uh, this stratum is destroyed, and we know that it's on the route of Shishak, and a fragment of a stele, a victory stele of Shishak was found here. So this has to be, so these are all linked that way. 
So it looks like there is archaeological confirmation of a political entity that's strong in the 10th century that's strong enough to have fortified sites at its northern and southern ends that is open enough to have a large administrative center in the in the interior that has easy relations with the Phoenicians, but poor relations with the Arameans or the Philistines. It is relatively small in terms of territory, not nearly as grandiose as the description in First Kings would like us to believe, but it does seem to be a kingdom. It does seem to be united. And the time of it conforms precisely with the biblically slotted in reigns of David and Solomon. That is the period known as the United Monarchy. The United Monarchy means a monarchy, a kingship, that all of this territory was under one ruler. The United Monarchy only lasts through the reign of Solomon. According to the Bible, in the Bible we read, Jeroboam, son of Nebat, rebelled against the king. He was one of Solomon's officials. Jeroboam is a workforce manager. He oversaw a bunch of workers. Solomon tried to kill Jeroboam, but Jeroboam fled to Egypt, to Shishak, and stayed there until Solomon's death. Solomon reigned for 40 years, then he rested with his fathers, was buried in the city of David, and Rehoboam, his son, succeeded him as king. Rehoboam went to Shechem, near Shechem, for all the Israelites had gone there to make him king. Shechem incidentally, is exactly next to Mount Ebal. From Mount Ebal, you look down at the city of Shechem. When Jeroboam heard this, he was still in Egypt from where he had fled, he returned. When the Israelites heard that Jeroboam had returned, they sent him and called him to the assembly and made him king. Only the tribe of Judah remained loyal to the house of David. So there's conflict. Rehoboam is not looked upon kindly by the people. Jeroboam, on the other hand, receives the support of most of the people. Only, only the tribe that had settled right around the area of Jerusalem, the tribe of Judah, remains loyal to the son of Solomon, and the part of the story that I didn't put up here is, um, Reb, according to the biblical text, then Rehoboam says to uh, Jeroboam, you know, you have, to, you have to do things my way. And, and Rehoboam asks for advice from all of his, uh, his advisors. And, and, and Jeroboam says, well, you've been really you and your father have been really bad to the people. You know, you've conscripted them in corvée labor, and that's not good, and people don't like that, so you have to stop that. And Rehoboam talks to his advisors, and advisors say, essentially, no. We, why? No. It's good this way. We like it this way. So, uh, so then Jeroboam says to Rehoboam, all right, well then, I'm not going to come back and be, be underneath you. And 10 out of the 12 tribal groups follow Jeroboam. So then Jeroboam fortifies Shechem, and that's where he lives. But he thinks to himself, uh-oh, the kingdom may revert to the house of David if these people go up to offer sacrifices at the temple which Solomon has built according to the text of 1 Kings in Jerusalem. That will be the end of my political independence. So after seeking advice, the king made two golden calves. He said to the people, it's too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. One he set up in Bethel, 
Beit El, the house of El, is the name uh, Beth El. And Beth El, which is not on this map, is right about there. It's just north of Jerusalem. And the other he set up in Dan. On the basis of this electrifying text, in the 1960s, Avraham Biran, an archaeologist with Hebrew Union College, went to Dan, this site way up here in the north, north of Chatzor, and began what remains the longest consistently running excavation in the country. You've already met Tel Dan because it was a big Middle Bronze Age Canaanite site. We looked at a mud brick gate from Dan. Uh, here is the mud brick gate was here in Area K, the Middle Bronze Age mud brick gate. On the top of the mound, on the highest point in Area T, which you see here in aerial view, Biran found a shrine, a long-lived shrine that was first built towards the end of the 10th century, looking for all the world like the cult place set up by Jeroboam after the split with Rehoboam. The high place at Don goes through three phases. The first, late 10th century, uh, there's a large stone platform, and you see that large stone platform here, built with uh, ashlar blocks. I have dimensions for you someplace here. Uh, there's a precinct, a whole precinct, which is 45 by 60 meters, and, uh, and this large stone platform is just under 18 meters square. So it's pretty high and pretty big. In front of the platform was an altar. And in a large room next to the altar were found over 40 vessels such as these. What sorts of vessels are these? Red slipped. Whose? Phoenician. Right. Over 40 Phoenician style vessels jugs, juglets, a couple incense burners, and two enormous pithoi, store jars, capacity over 300 liters. So very large. This high place was destroyed deliberately by fire. And a big um, uh, level of burnt mud brick covered this area down here. And it was rebuilt in the early 9th century. And when it was rebuilt, the subsidiary rooms in the front of the platform go away. And instead, a large podium for an altar is there. And you're looking at the area of the altar podium right here. And that altar podium is in front of the big uh, built-up square, which is now neatly surrounded by uh, an ashlar wall. Oops, that's the wrong Ashley Wall. That's a different period. It's this Ashley Wall. And now this platform is a full 18 meters square. And in the area of um, the altar, small horned altars were found. Oh, I forgot. I was Small horned altars, um, well, actually, I have these, uh, like these, like this one from Megiddo. Which is why today, if you go to Don and to the high place, you can see a reconstruction of the altar that uh, the Hebrew Union College excavators believe stood on this platform. And you see its cute little horns here 
on its corners. This level two was also destroyed dramatically by fire. And a third phase was constructed of the later ninth century. And this time, a very neat series of rooms appears on the west side of the precinct. The area of the altar is surrounded by its own precinct wall. And a series of a big staircase, which you see here, was constructed to allow uh, access to what must have been a new construction on the top of the 18 meter square platform. The staircase is monumental. It's eight meters wide. So it's very large. The whole of the area of the high place and indeed the whole of the city of Don is um, destroyed in the subsequent century, the 8th century. So this phase three lasts for about 75 or 80 years. But in the year 733, the latter part of the 8th century BCE, um, the Assyrians, the advancing Assyrians destroy Don. And we will get to the Assyrians and their activities um, more systematically next time. But anyway, they are, they are the people who bring the area of the high place down. Is there a question? Sir? Um, yeah, were these um, in the high place or that was destroyed just because it's just the high place? No. It uh, is not just the high place. It is also, oh, I forgot I was going to talk about this for a minute. It's also the area of the gate, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, you may recall the topographic plan of the city of Don. Most of it is unexcavated. We have the area of the Middle Bronze Age gate. We have the area of the high place. We have a teeny weeny little probe in the middle of the mound. Very little has come up from that. Uh, and then we have area A, which is the gate area, which we'll get to. And the uh, big destructions in the area of the high place also occur in the gate area. But we don't really have anything else. It could be that the whole city is burned down, but that's not likely. It's likely it's probably the entry area, the cult spot. Um, in uh, this room, wait, this room, I think, um, right, yeah, this room here, right next to uh, the precinct, the excavators found a small altar, a little side altar, um, that may have been for libations because uh, a sunken vessel was found in the ground right next to this. It may have been for libations or this may have been for blood from the animal, animal who was sacrificed here. Or this may have been for cleaning this off, and this may have just been for incense, because right next to this were found three incense shovels of bronze, two small incense stands, and a bronze scepter head which you see here on top of a modern wooden pole. So cult paraphernalia. Cult paraphernalia found in this side room near the precinct. Here's a plan again, topographic plan of Don. Here's the high place. Here's the Middle Bronze Age gate. And now we're going to move down here to area A. Area A is the gate area. When the high place is first built, the city is not fortified. There's no city wall, and there's no gate. It is only a cult center. There's a fortified city not very far from here, of course, and that city is Chatzor. That is a political settlement. 
which, as we'll see next time, is taken over by the kings of the northern kingdom when this split occurs in the latter part of the 10th century. And Hatzor continues to be an important administrative, political, fortified center. But Dan is a cult place only initially. It's not fortified. So there's a um, separation between political locales and religious locales in the northern kingdom. But in the second phase of the high place, so in the early part of the ninth century, a gate area is constructed down here. And you see a plan of the gate area here. And you, you've got a plan of this, too, I think, on your handout. Um, there is a, a forecourt, an open area, and a, a raised platform, which you see here, that had um, uh, decorated pillar bases on either side of it and was the area where somebody could sit in like a judge. It's kind of similar to that platform in Area M at Chatzor from the Bronze Age. But it's inside, inside the gate. So where some person could sit in ceremony. That's immediately inside here. And then in the subsequent second phase of the gate area, which uh, equates with the third phase of the high place and is the, therefore, um, later ninth century, an inner gate here is built. You see the inner gate right here. It's very, very monumental, very impressive. It's not connected with the wall. The inner gate is not connected with the wall. The outer gate area is connected with the wall. And uh, so you come through, you have to ignore this. Um, you come through here, and uh, you would, you'd pass through the inner gate area. And there is, in front of it, another one of these little broad rooms with a single entrance, like what was in, attached to the Megiddo gate. Looks like a little gate shrine area. This is, um, you're, looking, you're outside the gate now. You're outside the gate at dawn. And you can um, just see inside that, that um, dais, that canopy chair is right about there when you walk inside here. So you see it's this monumental paved area. Um, <clears throat> and in front of the paved area here, so this is outside the city, in front of the gate paved area here, in the 8th century, in the early part of the 8th century, there was built right in here um, what were probably like shops or a bazaar. And um, in 1993, when Avraham Biran and his team of conservators were fixing for conservation the walls, the foundations of the bazaar, they found this fragment of a large basalt inscription that had been broken and used as a construction block in the foundation of the bazaar. And the next year, in 1994, in continued conservation work, they found these two fragments. This is fragment A, and this is B1 and B2. And the inscription is an official inscription. It's not casual. As you can see from the script, it's very, very even. There are specific lines. Uh, the letters are neatly spaced. They're elegantly carved. The language of the inscription is Aramaic. The script is a derived alphabetic script from the Phoenician script. There is a lot of controversy about the inscription and especially about its reconstruction. There is a very good, this is the reconstruction um, of Biran and many other epigraphers, but there is a, there is strong evidence that this set of fragments, B1 and B2, actually belongs down here. And what we've got is a tall, slender 
monument. Um, and so aspects of this translation would be different if you move this fragment down here. But the sense of it is the same. Um, much of, obviously, many of the lines are, are lost, but there is fighting. And my father lay down, which means that the son who has set this inscription up has succeeded his father, who is now deceased. Lay down is the metaphor, biblical metaphor for dead. He went to his father's, just like it says in First Kings, David went to sleep with his father's and Solomon became king, or Solomon went to sleep with his father's and Rehoboam became king. And the king of Israel penetrated into my father's land, and Hadad made me myself king. Hadad is the, the god, the equivalent of Baal or Ale for the Arameans. Hadad went in front of me. I departed from blah, blah, blah. I killed two powerful kings. I killed Yoram, son of Ahab, king of Israel. And I killed Ahaziah, son of another king of the house of David. There's the phrase, the Aramaic phrase, House of David. Now, <laughs> about this inscription at dawn, it has to date prior to the destruction of the city in the later part of the 8th century, and it has to date enough before that that it was already broken and used in construction. So it's the late 9th or the early 8th century. There are a couple of possible um, identified Aramean kings and kings of the northern kingdom of Israel who fit into the historical framework for this. There was continued harassment and fighting across this northern border between the Arameans and the Israelites. That's why Hatzor was fortified in the first place. By this time, Israel is a kingdom. It's called a kingdom. It's got its own name, Israel. What is the house of David? Beit David. Two words put together as one, no um, divider. Here you can see, for example, on some parts of the inscription, little dots. See this dot, this dot, this dot, this dot. These divide words. They aren't everywhere, but they're in a few places. But Beit David, Beit David, right there, D, V, D, <laughs> um, is one word. What does it mean? The house of David. There are two explanations. One is that it stands for the southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah, which we know of from the biblical texts, and is evidence of the size of, and importance, the political equivalence of that kingdom with Israel, the northern kingdom, the breakaway kingdom founded by Jeroboam. But if that's the case, why is it referred to as the house of David as opposed to Judah, since Israel is referred to as Israel? So a second con um, guess is that it actually means the city of Jerusalem, which is mo nothing more than a kind of small feudal estate at this time when Israel is a large and going political concern. What the character is of Jerusalem and Judah, that is something that we will get to either next time or the time before. What the inscription unequivocally records for us, however, is the first and earliest mention of the person David as a critical figure in the politics and history of this area. Whether Jerusalem is a small feudal city or the capital of a kingdom, there was a person named David who was responsible initially for its appearance on the stage. See you next time.